The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we are going to see how to use what we saw last time about partial derivatives. to handle minimization or maximization problems involving functions of several variables. So before that, so remember last time we said that when we have a function, say, of two variables, x and y, then we have actually two different derivatives, partial f, partial x, also called f sub x, is the derivative with respect to x keeping y constant. And we have partial f, partial y, also called f sub y, where we vary y and we treat x as a constant. OK? And now, one thing I didn't have time to tell you about, but hopefully you heard about in recitation yesterday, is the approximation formula that tells you what happens if you vary both x and y. So f sub x tells us what happens if we change x a little bit by some small amount delta x. f sub y tells us how f changes if we change y by a small amount delta y. If we do both at the same time, then the two effects will add up with each other, right? Because you can imagine that first you will change x, and then you will change y, or the other way around. It doesn't really matter. So if we change x by a certain amount, delta x, and if we change y by the amount delta y, and let's say that we have z equals f of x, y, then that changes by an amount which is approximately f sub x times delta x plus f sub y times delta y. Okay, and that's one of the most important formulas about partial derivatives. Okay, so the intuition for this, again, is just the two effects add up. If I change x by a small amount, and then I change y, well, first changing x will modify f. How much does it modify f? The answer is the rate of change is f sub x. And if I change y, then the rate of change of f when I change y is f sub y. So altogether, I get this change in the value of f. And of course, that's only an approximation formula. Actually, there would be higher order terms involving second and third derivatives and so on. So one way to justify this I was distracted by microphone problem. <laughs> okay, so how do we justify this formula? Well, one way to think about it is in terms of tangent plane approximation. So let's think about the tangent plane to the graph of a function f. Okay, so I have some pictures to show you. It will be easier if I show the pictures. Okay, so remember, partial f, partial x was obtained by looking at the situation where y is held constant. So that means I'm slicing the graph of f by a plane that's parallel to the xz plane. And then when I change x, z changes, and the slope of that is going to be the derivative with respect to x. So now, if I do the same in the other direction, then I will have similarly the slope in a slice now parallel to the yz plane that will be partial f, partial y. So in fact, 
in each case, I have a line, and that line is tangent to the surface. So now if I have two lines tangent to the surface, well, then together, they determine for me the tangent plane to the surface. Okay, so let's try to see how that works. So, we know that f sub x and f sub y are slopes, are the slopes of two tangent lines to this plane, sorry, two tangent lines to the graph. And let's write down the equations of these lines. I'm not going to write parametric equations. I'm going to write them in terms of x, y, z coordinates. So let's say that partial f over partial x at a given point is equal to a. Then that means that we have a line given by the following conditions. So I'm going to keep y constant equal to y0. And I'm going to change x. And as I change x, z will change at a rate uh, that's equal to a. So that would be z equals z0 plus a times the change in x, x minus x0. Okay, that is how you would describe the line that's, I guess, the one that's plotted in green here, that's the intersection with a slice parallel to the xz plane. I hold y constant equal to y0. And z is a function of x that varies with a rate of a. Okay. And now if I look similarly at the other slice, let's say that the partial with respect to y is equal to b, then I get another line which is obtained by the fact that z now will depend on y and the rate of change with respect to y will be b, while x is held constant equal to x0. So these two lines are both going to be in the tangent plane to the surface. So they're both tangent to the graph of f. And well, together, they determine a plane. And that plane is just given by the formula z equals z0 plus a times x minus x0 plus b times y minus y0. Right. If you look at what happens, so this is the equation of a plane. Z equals constant times x plus constant times y plus constant. And if you look at what happens if I hold y constant and vary x, I recover the first line. If I hold x constant and vary y, I get the second line. Okay, another way to do it, of course, would be to write actually parametric equations of these lines get vectors along them and then take the cross product to get the normal vector to the plane and then get this equation for the plane using the normal vector. That also works and it gives you the same formula. So, you know, if you're curious, exercise, do it again using parametrics and using cross product to get the plane equation. Okay, so that's how we get the tangent plane. And now what this approximation formula here says is that, in fact, the graph of a function is close to the tangent plane. Okay? If we were moving on the tangent plane, this would be an actual equality. Delta z would be a linear function of delta x and delta y. And the graph of a function is near the tangent plane, but it's not quite the same, so it's only an approximation for small delta x and small delta y. So the approximation formula says the graph of f is close to its tangent plane. Okay? And we can use that formula of 
over here now to estimate how the value of f changes if I change x and y at the same time. Okay, questions about that? Okay, so now that we've caught up with what we were supposed to see on Tuesday, I can tell you now about max and min problems. So, that's going to be an application of partial derivatives. look at optimization problems. Okay, so maybe, you know, 10 years from now when you have a real job, your job might be to actually minimize the cost of something or maximize the profit of something or um, whatever. But typically the function that you will have to, you know, strive to minimize or maximize will depend on several variables. So, if you have a function of one variable, um, you know that to find its minimum or its maximum, you look at the derivative and you set that equal to zero, and you try to then look at what happens to the function. So here it's going to be kind of similar, except of course we have several derivatives. So, for today we'll think about a function of two variables, but it works exactly the same if you have three variables, ten variables, a million variables. So, the first observation is that, so if we have a local minimum or a local maximum, then both partial derivative so partial f, partial x, and partial f, partial y are both zero at the same time. So why is that? Well, let's say that f sub x is zero. That means when I vary x, well, to first order, the function doesn't change. Maybe that's because it's going through. If I look only at the slice parallel to the x-axis, then maybe I'm going through the minimum. But then, if partial f, partial y is not zero, then actually by changing y, I could still make the value larger or smaller. So that wouldn't be an actual maximum or minimum. It would only be a maximum or minimum if I stay in the slice. But if I allow myself to change y, that doesn't work. So I need actually to know that if I change y, the value will not change either to first order. So that's why I also need partial f, partial y to be zero. Now, let's say that they are both zero. Well, why is that enough? It's essentially enough because of this formula telling me that if both of these guys are zero, then to first order, the function doesn't change. And then, of course, there will be maybe quadratic terms that will actually turn that, you know, this won't really say that your function is actually constant. It will just tell you that maybe uh, it will be actually quadratic or higher order in delta x and delta y. And that's what you expect to have at a maximum or a minimum. Okay? So, we have... So that condition is the same thing as saying that the tangent plane to the graph is actually going to be horizontal. Okay, and that's what you want to have. Say you have a minimum. Well, see that the tangent plane at this point, at the bottom of the graph, is going to be horizontal. Okay. And you can see that on this equation of the tangent plane, when both these coefficients are zero, that's when the equation becomes z equals constant, a horizontal plane. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so we'll have a name for this kind of point, because actually, what we'll see very soon is that these conditions are necessary, but they're not sufficient. There's actually other kinds of points 
where the partial derivatives are zero. So let's give a name to this. We say, definition, we say that x, let's say x zero, y zero, is a critical point of f. If the partial derivative with respect to x and the partial derivative with respect to y are both zero. Okay. More generally, you would want all the partial derivatives, no matter how many variables you have, you want all the partials to be zero at the same time. Okay. So let's see an example. So let's say I give you the function f of x, y equals x squared minus 2xy plus 3y squared plus 2x minus 2y. Okay. And let's try to figure out whether we can minimize or maximize this. Well, so what we'd start doing immediately is taking the partial derivatives. Okay, so what is f sub x? Starts with 2x minus 2y plus 0 plus 2. Okay. Remember that y is a constant, so this differentiates to 0. Now, if we do f sub y, that's going to be, well, 0 minus 2x plus 6y minus 2. And what we want to do is set these things equal to zero. And we want to solve these two equations at the same time. Okay, so an important thing to remember, I mean, maybe I should have told you a couple of weeks ago already. If you have two equations to solve, well, it's very good to try to simplify them by adding them together or whatever. But you, mu you must keep two equations, okay? If you have two equations, you shouldn't end up with just one equation out of nowhere. Okay, so for example here, we can certainly simplify things by summing them together. See, if we add them together, well, the x's cancel and the constants cancel. And in fact, we're just left with 4y equals 0. That's pretty good. That tells us y should be 0. But then we should, of course, go back to these and see what else we know. Well, now it tells us, so if you put y equals 0, it tells you 2x plus 2 equals 0. That tells you x equals minus 1. Okay, so we have one critical point. That's x, y equals minus 1 and 0. Okay? Any questions so far? No? Well, you should have a question. question should be, how do we know if it's a maximum or a minimum? Well, yeah, so if we had a function of one variable, we would decide things based on the second derivative. And in fact, we'll see tomorrow how to do things based on the second derivative. But that's kind of tricky because there's a lot of second derivatives. I mean, we already have two first derivatives. You can imagine that if you keep taking partials, you may end up with, you know, more and more. Uh, so we'll have to figure out carefully what the condition should be. So we'll do that tomorrow. For now, let's just try to look a bit at you know, how do we understand these things by hand. So, in fact, let me point out to you immediately that there's more than maxima and minima. So remember, we saw you know, the example of x squared plus y squared that has a critical point that critical point is obviously a minimum. 
And of course, it could be a local minimum because it could be that, you know, if you have a more complicated function, there's indeed a minimum here, but then elsewhere, the function drops to a lower value. So we call that just, we call that just a local minimum to say that it's a minimum if you stick to values that are close enough to that point. Of course, you also have a local maximum. Well, I didn't plot it, but it's easy to plot, okay? <laughs> That's a local maximum. But there's a third example of critical point, and that's a saddle point, okay? So the saddle point, it's a new phenomenon that you don't really see in a single variable calculus. It's a critical point that's neither a minimum nor a maximum, because depending on which direction you look in, it's either one or the other. So here, see the point in the middle at the origin is a saddle point. Um, just, you know, if you look at the tangent plane to this graph, you'll see that it's actually horizontal at the origin. You have this mountain pass, you know, at a mountain pass, um, the ground is horizontal. But depending on in which direction you go, you go up or down. So we say that a point is a saddle point if it's neither a minimum nor a maximum. Okay, so... Possibilities could be a local mean, a local max, or a saddle. Okay, so tomorrow we'll see how to decide which one it is in general using second derivatives. Uh, for this time, let's just try to do it, you know, by hand. So, I just want to observe. In fact, I can try to, you know, these examples that I have here, they are x squared plus y squared, y squared minus x squared, they're sums or differences of squares. And if we know that we can put things as a sum of squares, for example, will be done. So let's try to express this maybe as the square of something. Well, so the, problem, the main problem is this 2xy. But observe, we know something that starts with x squared minus 2xy that is actually the square of something else. Right? It would be x squared minus 2xy, well, plus y squared, not plus 3y squared. So, let's try to do that. So, we are going to complete the square. So, I'm going to say it's x minus y squared. And then, so that gives me the first two terms and also a y squared. Well, I still need to add two more y squares. And I also need to add, of course, a 2x and minus 2y. It's simpler. It's still not simple enough for my taste. I can actually do better. See? I mean, now what's... So these guys look like a sum of squares, but here I have this extra stuff. But, oh... 2x minus 2y, well, that's twice x minus y. It looks like maybe we can modify this and make this into another square. Okay, so in fact, I can simplify this further to x minus y plus 1 squared. See, that would start like, I guess put parentheses here. That would be x minus y squared plus twice x minus y, and then there's a plus 1. Well, we don't have that plus 1, so let's remove it by subtracting 1. Let me find that minus one here, and I still have my two y squared. Okay, do you see why this is the same function as that one? Yeah? So, again, you know, if I expand x minus y plus one squared, I get x minus y squared plus twice x minus y, that's those guys, plus one. But I will have a minus one that will cancel out, and then I have a plus two y squared. Okay, so now what I know, see, this is a sum of two squares minus one, and this critical point, x, y equals minus one, zero, that's exactly when this is zero and that is zero. So that's the smallest value. This is always 
greater or equal to zero, same with that one. So that's always at least minus one, and minus one happens to be the value at the critical point. So it's a minimum. Okay. Now, of course, here I was very lucky. In general, I couldn't expect things to simplify that much. In fact, I cheated. I started from that, I expanded, and then that's how I got my example. <laughs> okay? So, the general method will be a bit different, but you will see it will actually also involve completing squares, just there's more to it than what we've seen. Okay, so, we'll come back to this tomorrow. Uh, sorry? Oh, do I, how do I know that this equals? Uh, y is what negative one? Sorry. Like, how do you, uh, you know that, you know that, that whole function is greater. Ah. How do I know that that whole function is greater or equal to negative one? Well, I wrote f of x, y as something squared plus 2y squared minus 1. Okay? This squared, it's always a positive number, or non-negative. Right? It's a square. The square of something is always non-negative. Similarly, y squared is also always non-negative. So if you add something that's at least 0 plus something that's at least 0, and you subtract 1, you get always at least minus 1. And in fact, the only way that you can get minus 1 is if both of these guys are 0 at the same time. Okay? So, that's how I get my minimum. So, more about this tomorrow. So, in fact, what I would like to tell you about now instead is a nice application of min-max problems that maybe you don't think of as a min-max problem, but you will see because, I mean, you don't think of it that way because probably your calculator can do it for you. Or if not, your computer can do it for you. But it's actually something where the theory is based on minimization in two variables. So very often in experimental sciences, you have to do something called least squares interpolation. And what is that about? Well, it's the idea that maybe you do some experiment and you know, you record some data. So you have some data X and some other data Y. And I don't know, maybe for example, X is, uh, you know, maybe you're measuring frogs and you're trying to measure how big the frog leg is compared to the eyes of a frog or whatever, or, you know, trying to measure something. And, you know, if you're doing chemistry, then it could be, you know, how much you put of some reactant and the output, how much of the output product that you wanted to synthesize is generated. Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, make up your own example. But so, you know, you measure basically for various values of x, what the value of y ends up being. And then, you know, you would like to claim, oh, well, these points are kind of aligned. I mean, of course, to a mathematician, they are not aligned, but to an experimental scientist, that's evidence that there's a relation between the two. And so you want to claim, and, you know, in your paper, you will actually draw a nice little line like that. See, these two functions depend linearly on each other. Okay? So the question is, how do we come up with that nice line that passes smack in the middle of the points? So, the question is, given experimental data, xi, yi, so maybe I should actually be more precise. So you're given some experimental data. You have, you know, a data point x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, xn, yn. The question would be, find the best fit 
line of a form y equals ax plus b that somehow in, you know, approximates very well this data. So, you know, you can also use that like a way to predict various things. For example, if you look at your new homework, actually the first problem asks you to predict how many iPods will be on this planet in 10 years. Okay? Uh, looking at, you know, past sales and how they behave. Um, one thing, by the way, before you you know, lose all the money you don't have yet. Uh, you cannot use that to predict the stock market, okay? <laughs> so don't try to use that to make money. It doesn't work. <laughs> so, one tricky thing here that I want to draw your attention to is what are the unknowns here? So the natural answer would be to say, well, the unknowns are x and y. That's not actually the case, okay? We are not trying to solve for some x and y. I mean, we have some values given to us, and when we are, look for, we are, when we are looking for that line, we don't really care about a particular value of x. What we care about is actually these coefficients a and b that will tell us what the relation is between x and y. So in fact, we are trying to solve for A and B that will give us the nicest possible line for these points. Okay, so the unknowns in our equations will have to be A and B, not X and Y. Okay, so the question really is find the best A and B. And of course we have to decide what we mean by best. So best will mean that we minimize some function of A and B that measures the total error that we are making when we are choosing this line compared to the experimental data. So maybe roughly speaking, it should measure how far these points are from the line. But now there's various ways to do it, and some of them are, I mean, they're all actually, you know, a lot of them are valid. They give you different answers. You have to decide what it is that you prefer. So for example, you could measure the distance to the line, you know, by projecting perpendicularly. Or you could measure instead the difference between for a given value of x, the difference between the experimental value of y and the predicted one. And that's often more relevant because, you know, these guys are actually maybe expressed in different units. They are not the same type of quantity. So you can't actually combine them arbitrarily. But um, anyway, so the convention is usually we measure distance in this way. Next, you could try to minimize the largest distance, you know, say we look at where's the largest error and we make that the smallest possible. The drawback of doing that is experimentally, very often you have one data point that's not good because maybe, you know, you fell asleep in front of the experiment and so you didn't measure the right thing. So you, you tend to want to, you know, not give too much importance to some data point that's far away from the others. So maybe instead you want to measure, you know, the average distance or maybe you want to actually give more weight to things that are further away, and then you don't want to do the distance, but the square of the distance. So there's various possible answers, but one, one of them gives us actually a particularly nice formula for A and B, and so that's why it's the universally used one. Okay, and so here it says list squares. Uh, so that's because we'll measure actually the sum of the squares of the errors. And why do we do that? Well, part of it is because actually it looks good. I mean, you know, when you see these plots in you know, scientific papers, they really look like the line is indeed the ideal line. And the second reason is because actually the minimization problem that we will get is particularly simple, well-posed, and it's easy to solve. 
So we'll have a nice formula for the best A and the best B. So, you know, if you have a method that's simple and gives you a good answer, then that's probably the good one. So, okay, so we have to define best. And here it's in the sense of minimizing the total square error. So, or maybe I should say total square deviation. Let me do that instead. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So the, the deviation for each data point is the difference between what you have measured and what you are predicting by your model. Okay, so that's the difference between yi and axi plus b. So now, what we'll do is we'll try to minimize the function capital D, which is just the sum for all the data points of the square of the deviation. Okay, so. Let me emphasize again, this is a function of A and B. I mean, of course, there's a lot of letters in here, but XI and YI, in real life, there will be numbers given to you. There will be the numbers that you have measured. You've measured all of this data. They are just going to be numbers. You put them in there, and you get a function of A and B. Okay? Any questions? Uh, no. Yes, no. Okay. So how do we minimize this function of A and B? Well, let's use our new knowledge. Let's actually look for a critical point. So we want to solve for partial D over partial A equals zero and partial D over partial B equals zero. That's how we look for critical points. So let's take the derivative of this with respect to A. Well, so it's going to be, well, the derivative of a sum is sum of the derivatives. And now we have to take the derivative of this quantity squared. So okay, remember how we take the derivative of a square, we take twice this quantity times the derivative of what we're squaring. So we'll get two times minus yi, sorry, yi minus axi plus b times the derivative of this with respect to a. What's the derivative of this with respect to a? Negative xi, exactly. Okay? And so we'll want this to be zero. And partial d over partial b, we do the same thing, but differentiating with respect to b instead of with respect to a. So again, sum of squares, twice yi minus axi plus b, times derivative of this with respect to b is, is I think, negative one, okay? So that's the equations we have to solve. Well, let's reorganize this a little bit. So, the first equation so, see there's A's and there's B's in these equations. I'm going to just look at the coefficients of A and B. If you have good eyes, you can see probably that these are actually linear equations in A and B. Although there's a lot of clutter with all these x's and y's all over the place. Okay, so let's actually try to expand things and make that more apparent. So, oh. 
first thing I will do is I will actually get rid of these factors of two that are just, you know, not very important. I can simplify things by two. And next, I'm going to look at the coefficient of a. Well, I will get basically a times xi squared. Well, let me just do it and then it should be clear. So I claim when we simplify this, we get xi squared times a plus xi times b minus xi yi. And we set this equal to zero. Okay, do you agree that this is what we get when we expand that product? Yeah, kind of. Okay, let's do the other one. So we just multiply by minus one, so we take the opposite of that, it will be AXI plus B, and we'll write that as X, XIA plus B minus YI. And, oh, sorry, I forgot the N here. And let me just reorganize that by actually putting, you know, all the A's together. That means actually I will have sum of all the XI squared times A plus sum of XI times B minus sum of xi yi equals zero. Rewrite this, it becomes sum of xi squared times a plus sum of the xi's times b minus one. Let me move the other guys to the other side, equals sum of xi yi. And that one becomes sum of xi times a. Plus, how many b's do I get from this one? Well, I get one for each data point. When I sum them together, I will get n. Very good. So n times b equals sum of yi. Okay, now these quantities, they look scary, but they're actually just numbers, right? So for example, for this one, you look at all your data points. For each of them, you take the value of x, and you just sum all these numbers together. So what you get actually is a linear system in A and B. A two by two linear system. And so now we can solve this for A and B. So in practice, of course, first you plug in the numbers for xi and yi, and then you solve the system that you get. Okay, and we know how to solve two by two linear systems, I hope. Okay, so that's how we find the best fit line. Now, why is that going to be the best one instead of the worst one? You know, we just solved for a critical point that could actually be a maximum of this error function D. Well, so we'll have actually the answer to that next time, uh, but trust me, if you really want to go through the second derivative test that we'll see tomorrow and apply it in this case, it's quite hard to check, but you can see it's actually a minimum. So I'll just say, we can show that it's a minimum. for the linear case is the one that we are the most familiar with, least squares interpolation actually works in much more general settings. Okay. Because 
because instead of fitting for the best line, if you think that there's a different kind of relation, then maybe you can fit, you know, in using a different kind of formula. So let me actually illustrate that with an example. So I don't know if you're familiar with Moore's law. It's something that's supposed to tell you how quickly, basically, computer chips become smarter, faster and faster over time. It's a law that says things about the number of transistors that you can fit onto a computer chip. So here I have some data about, oh, why is it? So, okay, better. So here's data about the number of transistors on, uh, you know, standard PC processor as a function of time. And well, you know, if you try to do the best line fit, well, you'll see quickly that it doesn't seem to follow a linear trend. Okay. On the other hand, if you plot the diagram in a log scale. You know, with, so the log of the number of transistors as a function of time, then you get a much better line. Okay. And so in fact, that means that you had an exponential relation between the number of transistors and time. And so actually that's what Moore's law says. It says that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every, so depending on the version, every 18 months or every two years, uh, they keep changing the statement. But so how do we find that best exponential fit? Well, so an exponential fit would be something of a form y equals a constant times exponential of a times x. Okay? That's what we want to look at. Well, we could try to minimize a square error like we did before, that doesn't work well at all. The equations that you get are very complicated, you can't solve them. But remember what I showed you on this log plot, right? If you plot the log of y as a function of x, then suddenly it becomes a linear relation. So observe, this is the same as ln of y equals ln of c plus ax. And that is a linear best fit. So what you do is you just look for the best straight line fit for the log of y. So that's something we already know. But you can also do other examples. For example, let's say that, you know, we have something more complicated. Let's say that we have actually a quadratic law. So for example, y is of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. And of course, you, you're trying to find, you know, somehow the best, so that would mean here fitting the best parabola through your data points. Well, to do that, you would need to find a, b, and c. Okay, and now you would have actually a function of a, b, and c, which would be the sum of all data points of the square deviation. And if you try to solve for critical points, so now you will have three equations involving a, b, and c, and in fact, you will find a three by three linear system and it works just the same way. Just you have a little bit more data. So basically, you see that these best fit problems are an example of, you know, minimization problem that maybe you didn't expect to see minimization problems come in, but that's really the way to handle these questions. Okay, so Tomorrow we'll go back to the question of how do we decide whether it's a minimum or a maximum and we'll continue exploring functions of several variables.